Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Raymond, and I lead programs, events, sponsorship, and membership here at WCET. As we go through today, you can download the slides. Kim will go ahead and share a link to the slides in the chat. I know you'll have questions, so please enter your questions into the Q&A box. And if you have resources or conversation to share, go ahead and put that into the chat, including let us know where you're at and what the weather's like today. I know a few of us that got on early were talking about the weather, and it sounds like there's a little bit of everything going on. So we'd love to know where you're at. Again, put your questions into the question box so we don't lose those. This is being recorded and we'll share a link to the recording, any shared resources in the slides. Today's webinar is AI Ethics, Governance, Policy and Practice in Higher Education, a strategic webcast for leaders and practitioners. And we are thrilled to do this in partnership with our friends at D2L. So shout out to D2L. Today's moderator is my friend and colleague, Van Davis. He's the Chief Strategy Officer here at WCET, and he leads a bunch of our AI work. So here's the face behind all of the good work that you've probably been seeing. So Van, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to you. Thanks a lot, Megan. Um, so welcome folks. We're um, thrilled that you are here with us today to talk about AI ethics and governance, something that we think is really critical here at WCET and are thrilled to have um, our colleagues and our sponsor uh, at D2L join us today. What I'm going to do is ask each of our three panelists to introduce themselves, and then I've got a few questions for them. Uh, but we're going to make sure that we leave plenty of time at the end for your questions as well. And Christy, since you are the first person on my screen, why don't you start us off with introductions? Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Really glad to be here today. Hello, colleagues. I'm Dr. Christy Ford. I serve as Vice President of Academic Affairs at D2L, and I'm looking forward to being a part of this conversation today. Judy, how about you go next? Sure, I'm really excited to be here and to join these wonderful colleagues. So I'm Judy Lewandowski. I serve as the Vice Provost for Adult Teaching and Learning at Purdue University Global. My focus there is on curricular design and faculty development. And Tina, you can round us out. Perfect. Hello, everyone. I'm Tina Perskell, and I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for CCC Online and Academic Affairs at the Colorado Community College System. Happy to be here today. So we are thrilled to have these three folks with us today for what we think is going to be a really important conversation, but also a really interesting conversation. Uh, and I'm going to start us off with a, a question for each of our panelists, and that is, what are you excited about regarding, to, uh, uh, regarding AI at your organization? I'll jump in. I think for us here at D2L, one of the things I'm excited about, uh, for us, it's really important to think about keeping the human in the loop. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that resonates with us here at the organization, but I'm really excited about the opportunities I think really specifically around teaching and learning and best practice around teaching and learning. So I really appreciate the opportunity to think about creating AI as a superpower for faculty, not a replacement, not an alternative, but really an opportunity to really hone in and find ways to create efficiencies for faculty, similar to what we find with a doctor. A doctor goes into practice to treat patients, not to do billing and coding. And so I, I'm really excited about the opportunity that we have to be able to give teachers that same opportunity to focus on engagement, um, utilizing AI as a tool. Well, I can I agree completely with Christy, as always. Um, I, at PG, at Purdue Global, one of the things that we're really focusing on is how can we use AI, how can we leverage it to really enhance the student experience? How can we identify friction points that the students experience um, that they as they navigate course structures or assignments and provide real-time support and clarification. So we're in the process right now, very early stages of developing the Purdue Global Learning Assistant, which is an AI powered um, operational device that provides personalized learning uh, content and support. So it's, it's basically a tool that we were able to embed within our LMS, which shout out to D2L, is Brightspace. Um, it's a conversational interface. So as students navigate the course and they have, especially those first couple of weeks, the questions about the syllabus and the assignments and the due dates and those sorts of things, 
rather than having the question and not having someone there because we, we are a fully online institution with adult learners, sometimes those faculty members aren't available at two in the morning. Amazing, maybe they would like to get some sleep. Uh, so rather than our students not having a support or a, a reference point, this device then allows them to be able to have just-in-time responses to those common questions. Right now we've got it in about, um, we're working with 800 students, so four different courses uh, in an initial pilot uh, the earlier this summer, later this summer, in early summer, uh, we will be able to step into our next phase, which will do a little bit more than course navigation and actually uh, promote some assignment components, um, giving students real-time feedback in terms of drafts that they're writing, uh, a, a application to rubrics, those sorts of things. So the focus is really on how can we take AI and really address some of those friction points that, that are commonly occurring. So in Colorado, um, CCCS, Colorado Community College System, is a system of 13 colleges across the state. And we are really in our infancy when it comes to AI. Um, but we are seeing some really exciting pockets of innovation at our colleges within certain disciplines, departments, and among our faculty. Um, I really like what you said about the human element, Christy, because it's really for us finding the right balance of human effort and automation. So where does it make sense to lean into automation and AI and its affordances? And where does that human touch and that human experience really take primacy? Um, we're really thinking about in a couple of categories, pedagogy, productivity, and learner support, much of which you've spoken about. Um, so in terms of curriculum, really looking at what, what kind of things do we need to weave into the curriculum to meet workforce demands, um, industry demands for, for AI, um, but also how do we leverage it to make our teams more effective and efficient as we address pedagogical and curricular innovations um, and just the work we do. Um, and in learner support, I've seen great things with chatbots and um, tools in the classroom and, and ways that our strategic business partners, our strategic platform partners like D2L, like our um, uh, uh, student information system, they're doing a lot with AI as well that's gonna really inform our whole ecosystem of how we support teaching and learning in the communities we serve. Thanks. So some of y'all may be familiar with the framework that WCET put together and released late last year, um, our AI policy and practice framework. And um, if you are, then you know that what we suggest is that um, at the foundation of any discussion about AI at institutions and organizations needs to be a discussion about um, the ethical and responsible use of artificial intelligence. But then we suggested that there are three different sort of categories of policy. There's governance policies, there are organization policies, and there are pedagogy policies. And so with that framework in mind, I've got a few questions for our panelists here. And Christy, I'm, I'm gonna start with you um, on the organization side. Could you elaborate a little bit on D2L's initiatives to enable and build capacity for your institutions and clients and how you're leveraging AI to do that? Absolutely. It's a, it's a really critical question that I think that most institutions should also be asking of their providers and partners as they're working with organizations that are providing support around AI. For us here at D2L, one of the things that we did first was focus on our AI principles. And for us, we wanted to create not just an opportunity to have specific language, but also be able to have action and impact that was atta attached to it. So when we think about our principles, we're thinking about transparency and privacy and accountability. So for instance, around transparency, it's one of the reasons why we have an AI roadmap that gives our clients transparency around the work that we're doing in the next six months around AI. Um, in the technology, as you think about the importance of equity and to think about making sure that we're not just using AI as an upsell opportunity, but that we are making sure that AI is across all platforms that we provide to our clients. 
We really wanna make sure that we create agency for our institution. So we want you to decide when and where you want to use AI so that it's really clearly an opportunity for institutions to make that individual choice. Uh, and then, then I will say around accountability, one of the things that I will talk about a little bit later is an internal assessment that we've created. We have several partners that we have collaborated with around AI, and even those partners go through what we call an internal impact assessment. And that assessment really looks at really areas that we wanna re impose requirements on our partners around what is best practice and what's best for our clients. I'll give you one example. A really great client of ours that we're finding really great support and partnership is Bongo. We, we sent that partnership through our AI impact assessment and found that there were some additional criteria that we wanted to impose on that partnership to make sure that, that our the humans were in the loop and that our institutions and our clients we're gonna be front and center. Uh, the last thing I will say to you in terms of building capacity, because we find that institutions are at various levels of support and having conversations around AI. Last December, we released an AI ethics and governance course, and I'm happy to drop the link in the chat that's available to anyone to really start to catapult those conversations and dialogue on campuses. And so, for us, it's starting with this North Star around our AI principles, but making sure there are ha we have impact and we have actions that keep us accountable around this work. Thanks, Christy. Um, Tina, I know that you referenced earlier that y'all are looking at pedagogy, productivity, and learner support. I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about how y'all are seeing AI as a way of enhancing productivity and efficiency um, over there. You bet. So um, I mentioned earlier about that we're using AI for design and development of courses. Um, so we're working with one of our, par our course development partners to look at how we can test AI to facilitate our course development process. So things like using a private and secure, because that's a really important thing, large language model to develop content to help our learning designers um, take information, large amounts of information and summarize it, distill it down. It's really a tool that it's not about product, it's about process. And so although it can produce product, we don't necessarily want to um, have, you know, just replicate and use what information comes out of it. But it's another tool to work between a learning designer and a subject matter expert to say, here are your course descriptions. Give us a, a proof of concept for what those might look like for a, um, a number of program learning outcomes or taking a large amount of OER materials and, and boil it down to a few key themes so it could facilitate the conversation between the learning designer, the ed tech specialist, the, the animation person, and, the, and of course the faculty member. And so there are a lot of really creative ways that we're exploring it. But the key piece to that is, is really finding an environment where you feel safe as an organization to put in your intellectual property. So one of the, I know we're going to talk about ethics in a bit, but I think that's a really key piece is where do you, what systems do you train with your information, with your faculty's academic property how do you train that large language model in a way that you have faith that that's not going to end up, you know, somewhere else that you didn't intend it to be? Um, in terms of productivity, um, one of the things that I found really intriguing is because we're going through a lot of strategy changes here at CCC Online, moving into Colorado Online, is the scenario building that you can do. You can take different um, types of perspectives and not only summarize it, but recast it in a voice. So if you take a, a uh, policy brief and you, say, you can put it into AI and say, I need 
you to summarize the key three themes that I need to take to my chancellor on this vast amount of data. And it can really help facilitate and streamline the, the business analysis that normally would have taken me hours to do. It can really help with productivity. So I can do the human intervention and add my critical thinking skills to it um, and, and really focus on giving it my own voice um, without having to adapt the, the voice of the AI model. So some exciting things. Yeah, and there's something that you said there, Tina, that I think is um, really important that I hope that we have some time to come back to, and that is this um, intersection between IP and ethics and privacy and security, uh, and that, that y'all are in the position where you're able to use um, a private large language model, but there is an equity issue around that. Not all institutions are going to be able to do that, so hopefully we'll have some time to circle back and, and tease out um, what some of those ethical considerations are and how that intersects with equity considerations as well. Um, but Judy, I want to turn to you. Um, you are doing a lot in terms of instructional design and, and AI, and I'm wondering if you could talk a few minutes about how you think AI can transform the learning design process. Absolutely. I think Tina started us off from this part of the conversation in a, a great way. There's just so many examples of tools that we can use. I, I really see the AI as an amplifying agent, a tool that will, I mean, I've spent a lot of time with learning design. That's That was my faculty background. So I've been working with learning designers for, for decades. And often when I talk to my students after they've graduated and they're in the field, their pain points that they they reference are not necessarily the creative or the critical thinking aspects. It's all the sort of the drudgery of the position that they have to do. And so I like to think that AI will be a tool or can be a tool to help to eliminate some of that work, that baseline work that really doesn't speak to their expertise. So being able to, to be able to, to pull together course blueprints or organizations or, or outcomes and be able to have that conversation like Tina explained and, and have that facilitating and making sure that it's curating a broader range than maybe you, one person alone would have would have come up with, I think is a, a great stepping stone. You know, I've, I've seen online folks saying, well, will our jobs go away because this tool will take them? I don't think so. I really don't. I think that the tools are excellent at beginning the process but it takes a, a human expert, a strong learning designer to really know the nuance of both the, the faculty who's going to be teaching that course and their particular teacher presence, along with the needs of those students. Because as we know, on paper, a learner analysis is very different than what's actually the interaction of the classroom environment. You know, this is a complicated area. It's exciting, but it's, it's tricky. So one of the things we've done at Purdue Global, we had an AI task force that has done a tremendous amount of things um, and, and produced several different policies and, and ideas to work through. But one connected to pedagogy is an AI curriculum guide. So it's a tool agnostic guide. We aren't saying one particular tool is great because goodness knows they'll blink and it'll change and something else will come out and be better and faster. Uh, but it's tool agnostic. It's aligned to best practice and it's aligned to Bloom's taxonomy. And what it does is it serves as a, a stepping stone for faculty members and learning designers to consider how AI might be infused within a course, uh, within a strategy, within a program. Are there different activities or instructor engagements that we can utilize this tool so that we can develop an awareness, build that ethical framework in terms of what's the appropriate use, what's inappropriate use, and really, afford our students an opportunity to, to have a chance to work with these tools because we know down the road this will be an expectation for employers. So we're very early in the process. So the guide is done. We've just gotten all of our approvals. Welcome to academia. Uh, and we're beginning the process of really infusing that. The other piece to it, just so that it doesn't look like we have everything together, um, we're also at the same time navigating tool selection, right? We have to do our due diligence in terms of which tools are appropriate and secure and private and fit the needs of our institution. So that right now, so we, we have ideas on how to use it. And we're now in the, I like how you said it, Tina, the infancy of figuring out, okay, now we have a sense of what we'd like to do. Let's, let's cautiously step into selecting the tools that we want to do. 
Um, I always use the example that as a faculty member, I, I loved trying something new and, and pulling it into my classroom. But if you only have 30 students and it's sort of, you know, it's a closed circuit kind of moment, that's one thing. When we're looking at making decisions for 35,000 students, we have to be a little bit more cautious. So it's exciting. Uh, we don't have all the, stay tuned for all the answers. I hope we get there. Uh, but I think this framework will help be a, a great guide in terms of brainstorming and considering how we can actually embed AI within the, the classroom uh, environment. So I'm, I'm, I'm really struck by a couple of things that, that you said there, um, Judy. One is, um, of course, um, circling back to that it's the humans that matter here. The technology is a wonderful tool, but at, at heart, it's what we do with the technology. It's the human piece of that element. It's the human element. And then also this, this need to do due diligence uh, around pool selection. Um, and Christy, I, I want to turn back to you um, around this issue, because I know that, that at D2L, generally the organization, but you especially have done a lot of thinking about what you're going to, what sort of guidelines you're going to impose on yourself mm -hmm. as you're building these things out. Could you talk a little bit about what sort of guardrails yeah. you're putting in place? Absolutely. As Judy mentioned, you know, similar to what they're doing there, we have an AI working group. Um, I'm, I'm, I have the privilege of serving on that working group. And we're continuing to think about how we can do a better job of implementing these principles and refine the direction that senior leadership is taking around this AI work. We, we all talk about the emphasis that we're all in with this disruption, but this will be iterative, right? These conversations will continue to have to occur as we learn more, as we uncover more. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the impact assessment. Um, that internal impact assessment really gets us to think about the various areas of AI deployment. So we're thinking about the ethical considerations. We're thinking about the potential societal effects, privacy comp, you know, implications, compliance with reg relevant regulations. And so, you know, we're meeting on a regular weekly basis talking about these conversations. I'll give you one internal example as we've been utilizing some AI tools or considering using some AI tools to create efficiencies of our internal work. And given that we're a global organization, we as we went through this impact assessment, we realized that the, the tool was biased in North America. But we have clients in South Africa, we have clients in other parts of the, of the world. And so we had to take a moment of pause and figure out how can we mitigate even that kind of bias. And so for us, it's really making sure, you know, thinking about even the use of Zoom, making sure that if we're utilizing some of the uh, AI features, that it's not only capturing the loudest voice in the room, that we need to be aware of these kinds of considerations. And so as a global organization, we're taking to, into account some of the gold standards that we're seeing around safeguards, like the EU AI Act. Uh, and colleagues, for those who may not be aware, the European Union has really opted for an AI legal framework that really embraces an industry agnostic approach and a perspective to really thinking about the way in which AI compliance needs to happen at institutions, at organizations. And so we have adopted that on ourselves. We're watching that drafted uh, policy work go forth now. We, we're always thinking about how can we be in compliance with that gold standard? Um, so it's those kinds of things are the ISO 42001 uh, piece, the inter international standard that talks about specific requirements around establishing, implementing, uh, maintaining, and continuously improving AI within organizations. You know, so thinking about what operational um, controls that are immediately important in terms of governing high-risk implementations. You know, these international standards give us uh, and the work that we're doing here in the U.S. and in North America opportunities to really think about what are institutions asking of their partners? And so we want to be in good partnership with our institutions and really thinking through some of these things. So this, just a couple of things, you can see I'm really passionate chatting about this, but these are the kinds of things that we are consistently grappling with. I think we may come back and, and, and circle back to some of this. I'm, I'm really thrilled though that you mentioned the EU standards because I do think that, that the EU is considerably further 
down the road than the United States is or, or Canada is, because you all are a Canadian co uh, company, uh, in thinking about what the legal framework is going to be around artificial intelligence and the sort of legal guardrails that need to be put in place. So if, if anyone hasn't had a chance to look at those EU guidelines, I would, I would urge you to do that. It's, it's a really interesting framework. Um, Judy had mentioned earlier, I, I think had alluded earlier to making sure that our students understand how to use AI and the importance of that. And Tina, I wanted to, to ask you, from where you're sitting with the Colorado Community College System, where workforce development is obviously a really critical piece of your mission, um, can you talk a, a little bit about what you're hearing from employers and, and how you're trying to meet those employer needs in training your students? You bet. You know, there's a myth that AI is going to reduce jobs. And um, I was listening to an article from uh, Hayden Brown, who's the CEO of Upworks, and she said that 64 64% of folks in the C-suite have reported that AI is going to actually require them to hire more, not fewer individuals because of the technology. And so occupations will be shaped and enhanced by AI rather than replaced by it. Um, and it's generating a lot of demand for workers with new skills. So what we're hearing is that people need to come into the organizations and help them figure out how to use and unlock the technologies. But it's interesting that in our conversations with companies, we're hearing that they don't necessarily want us to train people on programming, building the models, but it's really how do they understand AI literacy? How do they weave that in to their existing occupations? So they're looking for policy support, usage support. Um, but what was really interesting is it varies by sector. Before this um, conversation, I reached out to Mike Backlund, who's our ABC of Workforce Development, and he attended a recent Colorado Workforce Development Council, and they connected with aerospace partners, and AI came up. And what those companies talked about was actually the banning the use of AI until we can get a handle on the privacy, on the equity, on the you know, the parameters of um, safe use. Um, the perception for that sector was that the risk of losing their IP was actually greater at this moment in time than the benefit of usage. So we're seeing variability in the different industries and sectors, but I think one of the key takeaways is, you know, we hear a lot in the media that we're all gonna be replaced by, you know, the cyborg or the bot, and really our lives are gonna be changed and enhanced. Um, so don't quit your job and become a dog walker. I know that, you know, burning glass said that that's like the most resilient profession, although I'd love to be a dog walker. Um, you know, our jobs will be not eliminated, just enhanced by this technology. I'm, I'm laughing. I have no dogs to walk, but I do have cats that walk on leashes. So there we go. Maybe a dog walker or a cat walker. That might be a little bit more difficult. Um, let's talk literacy, AI literacy here for a few minutes and, and how that um, can impact equity and the digital divide. And, and Judy, I, I want to turn to you. And I'm wondering if, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how the curriculum design that y'all are doing at Purdue Go Global um, promotes AI literacy as a way of beginning to break down the digital divide. Yeah, just like Tina, Tina referenced, it, this is something that employers are expecting students to have a knowledge of, right? This is a basic literacy. It's not that you necessarily need to be a machine learning expert, but you need to use it in terms of relevance for your career pathway. And so when we think about embedding AI within the curriculum, it's really emphasizing that relevance. So intentionally designing for the career pathways of the students. It may be, as, as Tina described, that there are some where, you know, the aerospace industry, maybe they're using it clearly different than others. KPMG reported this morning, there was an interview that came out and they said they are committing $2 billion to AI initiatives 
And they um, went on record to say that every one of their positions in their global workforce would have an AI component to their um, job structure. So when we're looking to graduate the, the next workforce or to have folks upskill, it's, it's a, our ethical responsibility to make sure that they're aware of AI and the literacy and how it's used, how it can be appropriately used, um, and not just as a, a global reference point, but specific to their career focus. So it's, it really requires then um, individuals who are experts in the field, industry connections, making sure that it's real-time connections, not someone who it's been 25 years since they've been in the field. I'm sure they've got lots to offer, but we need somebody who's out there and has a sense of this is what boots on ground looks like, and then pull it into the classroom and make it a pragmatic example or exercise so that it becomes just another tool in the toolbox. Our courses don't have to become completely AI focused. It shouldn't be unless you're in an AI course. It's really about how can these tools help us to better do the work that we're trying to do to get to the outcomes that we're, we're trying to um, attain. And so it's, it's that key component of the intentional design. You can't just wing this. You really have to be thoughtful on it, making sure that it's relevant, not only to the students, but to the career pathway. And then again, that, that overarching due diligence of, yes, we're gonna be using these tools, but we're gonna do it in a way that allows folks to, do, to step into the shallow end and, and begin that process so that there, we can mediate some of that risk that, that we know some of these tools can bring. It's, it's an exciting time. It's a pretty complicated time, um, but I think, it'll, I think the impacts will be really positive. Well, and, and, and I, you're right, it is an exciting time, but it's also a really complicated time. Mm -hmm. folks, folks that, that um, Some of the folks that may know me know that I was trained as a civil rights historian, that that was my, my first path and my first job was a, a professor of history, uh, focusing on the civil rights movement. And so I tend to look at these things through an equity lens. And all three of you have, have referenced equity, but I, I wanna spend a few moments sort of digging a little bit deeper. And before I go to you, Christy, though, I, I want to remind folks to put questions in the chat, or excuse me, in the Q&A. So we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, but, but please put more in there, and we're going to turn to your questions here in a minute. But before we do, Christy, I want to pivot over to you. Um, I know from other webinars that you and I have been involved in, and, and um, Margarita Fuel's conversations that we have had as well, that uh, you're very passionate about thinking about the way in which AI and equity um, interplay together and, and both some of the opportunities and some of the dangers. Could you talk a little bit about how you see D2L trying to balance that formula between equity, equitable and inequitable access to AI and the opportunities and, and the challenges that AI is going to bring to what's already oftentimes an inequitable um, educational system? Gosh, that's a great question. And I have so much to offer here. I'll try to be concise. I think for me, as I was listening to Judy and Tina speak earlier, one of the things that we have to realize around this equity divide that, that is going to further exacerbate this digital divide, to your point earlier, Van, around digital literacy, if we are not uh, uh, equipping individuals to be able to be well versed in AI, it is a good, it is a common known factor that it's less about a machine taking a job from you because of AI. It is an individual who is understands and how to use AI that will get that job. And unfortunately, in historically marginalized communities, in areas where there has not been digital literacy historically, now this just adds an additional layer. And so I want to just really, really be clear as, as I hear, you know, there are ethical considerations, there are concerns, and we've had conversations around authentic assessments and being really thoughtful about that. But for us at D2L, we're really trying to think about making sure that, that we are not engaging in any partnership or any opportunity where there is bias. I used the example earlier uh, around North America, but really one of the things, Van, you and I have talked about is really thinking about the ethical considerations, even in image generation, right? And understanding and having fluency around the things that these LLMs have been 
uh, trained on or exacerbating stereotype threats. And so we have to be really just aware of those colleagues as educators to make sure that we are not doing, we are doing our due diligence and we are informing a larger conversation here. I think the other thing for us at D2L, one of the things that we have are excited about is partnering with Michael Feldstein on his AI Learning Design Assistant Project, which is a six month project to help design and build workshops for, in, for institutions and universities um, interested in learning design. We signed up to be an equity sponsor because we knew that it was really a matter of not just focusing on, yeah, we can be a great technology partner, but we wanted to pay it forward for an institution that may not have the resource to be a part of that conversation and to really create agency and buy-in and, and, and really be able to, to lift our sales in the ways that other institutions might might be afforded to do that. And so um, I mentioned earlier about making sure that AI is in all levels of the platform, really trying to not make sure that it's not in our premium product that is available only as an upsell or only as an add-on, but making sure that we're deliberately thinking about in every area of our platform, in every area of our partnership with our institutions, we are considering how we can really um, eliminate that that divide. And, and it is, it, it's a complex conversation and I don't think that we're not there yet, but I think that as we continue to be intentionally focused on these things, it will allow us all collectively to have greater awareness around it. Sorry to find the unmute button there. Um, I, I really appreciate that response, uh, Christy, and I, I appreciate the sort of thought that, that you've that you personally have put into these issues. Um, before we, we've got some questions in the Q&A here, and before we turn to that, though, I want to see if either Judy or Tina want to add anything to this sort of intersection between equity and AI and access and the challenges and the opportunities that surround that. I think Christy did an excellent job of capturing the, the, the problem that we're facing in terms of the digital divide. And if we, it's very easy and it's almost tempting at times. Um, one of the hats I wear is that I, I end up doing a lot of the, or leading the policy discussions. And this is messy. It's it's really tough right now to navigate and to land on, on policies that will guide us in a way that we can still move forward, but we're, we're still keeping a, a level of protection and security. And so it's, it's tempting to want to say, well, let's just not engage with these tools because it would be easier and safer. Um, but that's where the digital divide, I think, runs the risk of becoming wider and wider because these students, especially the adult learning students that we, we serve, these are the folks who really need that, that advantage going into the workforce. And so it's, it propels us to do that hard work of, of figuring out these policies and to, to step into the mess and to, to navigate this gray area so that we can be able to give these opportunities so that these students, as they graduate, when they enter the workforce, they have these strong skills and an awareness so that they can also you know, ask these hard questions in their the organizations they lead then. I'll just add that plus one to everything. Um, as a community college system, you know, our, our mission and the, our whole reason for being is around access, affordability, and equity. And with any technology tool, we ask ourselves, who does this serve and who might be left behind? And one of the challenges that, that we have is that we can't get stuck in the inertia. We can't, we can't, we have to address it. We have to have these conversations because ignoring it, we become further, you know, we, we go against our mission and further perpetuate um, that digital divide for the communities that we serve. So, so we have to be thoughtful, but we have to continue the conversation. I, I love that being thoughtful, but continuing the conversation. And 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 Judy, I love what you said about you know we run the risk if if we're not thoughtful about this of furthering the digital divide and making it wider rather than than narrowing it. I want to turn, we've got some great questions in the Q&A, and um, I want to start with the first question here by Dan Barnett, because he references something that we've sort of talked a little bit around, but haven't directly addressed that yet, and that is this question of grades and assessments. Um, in this age now, what do grades actually measure? 
Um, is it measuring what's in a student's head? Do you know the answer? Or is it measuring now how students perform? Do you know how to find the answer? So I'm wondering what y'all think about assessments now in the age of AI. I, I, so I can't help myself. I, I think that this is a conversation that we have been grappling with Dan um, from the beginning of time. I think this is a conversation when CBE and skills forward and mastery based uh, assessments became forefront. It's really a question around what are you measuring when you're measuring learning? How do you measure learning? Um, so I'd love to grab some coffee with you and talk about this in detail, but I really think in the in the absence or the, in the time of AI, I think it is requiring us, I still teach um, courses online myself, it's requiring me as a faculty member to be very intentional about what am I designing in my courses? So if I'm utilizing an opportunity, I teach a writing course, a developmental writing course, if I'm utilizing AI or I'm, I notice that half of my students are English as a second language learners, how can I provide them opportunities to utilize the AI for the brainstorming opportunity? You know, where are there ways that I have to kind of up my game as I think about the ways that I want to really assess what I'm sending these students out into the world to be able to, to you know, to be able to produce. And so um, I'll, I'll stop there because I'll go on a tangent. I mean, I, I think it, it, Christy, again, has targeted it well. I mean, it, it all goes back to authentic assessment and really looking at what you're trying to measure and what it is that you want these students to be able to do. Um, and. I think it's it's going to require many folks to take a look at their class and, and look at their assessment structure to see if, are we really measuring what we're intending? Or is it something that's been sort of packaged in the course and we've kind of used from semester to semester? So I think it's it offers a, a chance for us to really look at how we're measuring student, student outcomes and really considering, is there maybe another way that we can do that? Yeah, I just look at it as just another consideration in my toolkit as, as a designer and a professor of instructional design. It's one more thing to think about. And it go, for me, it goes back to that alignment of learning outcomes, instructional strategy, and assessment. And so this is just one kind of nuanced consideration as I think about assessments. But at the end of the day, it's really that, as Judy says, as as Christy says, it's it's what what learning are you you know what outcome are you measuring and and how does that get demonstrated in how does a learner demonstrate proficiency or mastery um, or achievement of the learning outcome in a time where AI is is part of the ecosystem now? Can I just say one more thing? Just one more thing. I think as I'm listening to you, Tina, the other thing that just occurs to me. If, if you all listening today have utilized chat GBT, what you, you, you know this, like the output is dumb. Like the ways in which that you look at the output, it is not sophisticated. It is not, when we talk about the hot, so we talk about Bloom's taxonomy, it is not higher level critical thinking. So again, I think um, as you spend more time with these tools and technologies, you will realize that they are not providing this, you know, brand exciting new view to, um, very extensive, critically thoughtful, well-provoked opportunities to have engaging, meaningful assessments. So I, I think there's still some there's still some good work that we can do here. I'm 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 smiling because I'm I'm always reminded back in the 1990s when I was in graduate school, um, my PhD comprehensive exams. They set us in a room with a set of uh, a stack of blue books and eight hours to answer three questions without any resources. And it was so inappropriate because I never wrote a lecture like that. I never prepared a lesson like that. And, and I wonder if, if we aren't sort of looking at the same thing here now where it's, it's not so much um, our ability to memorize information as it is what we do with that information that's becoming increasingly important. Um, we've got a, a number of questions about AI-generated content um, that I wanted to, to turn to y'all with. Um, so uh, Jane Deacon uh, writes that I attended a webinar a while back in which one school up talked about using AI to create videos of a beloved but deceased faculty member's lectures. The speaker presented it as a good thing, but as a faculty member, I found it frightening. 
I'd be curious about the panelists' views of the opportunities and threats of AI-generated content, including video, images, music, et cetera, and deep fakes that might be with or without the individual's permission. So I'm wondering if this doesn't sort of harken back to some of the conversation we had earlier about guardrails um, and, and how each of you at your organizations are thinking about the role of AI in generating content uh, and what that means for you at your organization and what it means for the staff that you work with. It's a big question, I know. I mean, I can I can start us off. I that's disturbing. I mean, it's it's this is where I mean it's a great example of why guardrails are are critically important. Um, the follow up then, what are the guardrails? I think that's where we're in the midst of it, right? We're trying to figure this out because there are, I think. I think the biggest aspect, though, that we have to keep in mind is that as we navigate and write these policies and, and put things into place, that we treat it them like the Constitution, a living document, right? Something that we can modify and amend because things will always change. And right now, we don't know what we don't know. And so it's it's sometimes hard to even begin to, to consider all of the possible things that we need to, to think about in terms of these tools and the ramifications they could have. Um, I don't know that that's very profound, but that's what I would say is that this is a great example of why guardrails are needed and it also uh, underscores why they're so difficult to write and put into place. It just makes me think about the importance of discernment and critical thought is, and what as consumers of this content, um, you know, how do we, particularly the notion of, of the deep fake, right? Because we're going to see more and more of this artificially generated content. And, and I think part of that conversation as we think about pedagogy and literacy is that discernment piece of helping people be better consumers. I think we have an obligation as we're looking at what does competency for, um, for our it, you know, as we teach AI fluency, um, really helping folks be discerning as consumers of this content. Um, I, I, I think this is a really great example of, of uh, an opportunity to have those kind of comfort conversations because, boy, is that a nuanced use case. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Judy and Tina. Um, you know, as I listen to that example, um, it also makes me wonder, what are we doing to ban your question around the guardrails? What are we doing to police ourselves? Um, how many of you have an accept accept acceptable use AI policy at your organization? We do. Um, and making sure that we are being our own police, our own guardrails around what we find to be acceptable and not acceptable, and then kind of governing around that. I think one of the other things that we have done around AI in terms of our technology, one of the first pieces that we put out um, as an AI opportunity was to create these practice questions in the system. But we decided because we heard from so many of our clients and we knew that it was just good practice is that those practice questions are based on an, a faculty member's content, not the LLM. It is not going back beyond that the parameters of that course content to be able to create those practice questions. And so I think it's onerous on all of us that are concerned and having these conversations to continue to push back and to continue to elevate these conversations on our at our institutions and organizations and push back on our partners to make sure that there is due diligence there. Yeah, this is, this is an, an incredibly thorny and complex and nuanced um, issue when we start talking about AI-generated content, um, both within the classroom and within our institutions as well as societally, uh, especially as we move into an election year. So I, I appreciate uh, that response. Um, let's talk a little bit about faculty. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a question in the chat um, of how, are you in, how, how do we engage, include older faculty into becoming more knowledgeable about using AI in their classes 
And what challenges are you seeing for that segment of faculty who are teaching the students of today? So it's the, it's the perennial, what do we do with older faculty question? Well, I can chime in quickly on that. Um, you know, we at Purdue Global, we really make an effort to include all of our faculty in all that we're doing. I mean, I think collectively we can all say that, right? Um, but we, we created a free course. So we have a non-credit course. I'm happy to pop it into the chat. Um, and we sent that out to the faculty and it's it's a pretty quick one to be able to go through, but it, it level sets a basic understanding because so often you'll hear about AI, but if this isn't your area. If you teach, you know, Roman history, maybe this isn't something that you dig into regularly, like our computer science folks might have a better understanding. So what that course did was it allowed us to have a conversation across our institution about basic knowledge in terms of what AI is, what it means, some, some ethical considerations, some applications, and just begin the dialogue so folks didn't feel like they had to go everywhere to find that information. Um, in terms of really engaging all of our faculty, the learning assistant that I described earlier, one of the, the components of it that I'm most proud of is the collaborative development and design approach we've used. So it slowed us down a little bit because we're not just leaning on our software engineers, but this means that we have um, a wide range of faculty members, learning designers, administration throughout our campus, lots of different folks from our different centers coming together to have input at every stage of our creation from use case scenarios all the way through actual responses that the LLM will give. And it's, but it's pulling those individuals in, but they're not, our faculty are, they're not AI experts. We, we invited folks who are of all different ages, I hate to just lay that on there, but individuals from across our institution, many, I, I mean, I, I charged our group to find the, the folks to, to move beyond the usual suspects because we didn't want just the individuals who were always raising their hand, but we wanted to make sure we pulled in faculty members who on the paper would probably not be the first adopters of AI. And that's been wonderful because they bring a different perspective and then they can be real champions for us as we go out because they have you know, buy-in with their colleagues who they've taught with for 20 some years and they can say, look, this is working or this has some potential and here's here's my perspective on why. So I think it takes a lot of effort and it, and it really it goes back to that intentionality. None of this can be done um, just winging it. You really have to plan and consider and invite folks to be able to, to step in. I'm happy to pop that course in the, the chat. That was, that's been helpful to, to uh, begin the conversation for sure. Yeah, we found that um, our innovators and come from all, you know, our new faculty, our very well seasoned faculty. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's not just the younger whippersnappers who, who are innovating. Some of our faculty who have been around for a long time are doing some really innovative and creative things in exploring this space. Um, and, and I agree, Judy, I think amplifying those voices and getting faculty to work together and share those effective practices and their lessons learned. And as, as administrators, how do we support those efforts, I think is really key. So we're, we're coming up on the top of the hour, and I'm going to exercise my moderator prerogative to ask you um, one final question here. And, and that is, if you could think about an important piece of advice or a lesson learned um, that you have for folks working on AI at their organizations, what would that be? I'll jump in. Um, first of all, let me just say this chat has been on fire. Uh, really grateful to see so much engagement. My um, piece of advice was to be involved in the conversation. Just as you've done today on this webinar, I hope that you're engaging at your institutions or your organizations. And find ways to influence at any level of the organization. You don't have to be uh, at the highest senior level to be uh, of influence around these conversations. We need a collective uh, conversation happening on multiple levels. Um, the thing I will say along with that is to be able to be a part of this conversation, you have to spend time with these tools, colleagues. You have to be fluent 
uh, in these tools to be able to understand the nuances and the complexities of this conversation. Um, so be engaged with the tools and be involved in the conversation at your organizations would be my takeaway. I would just add that the collaborative design is worth the, the, the effort. Um, when you step into these types of things, whether it's you, that you're looking at policy development or tool um, acquisition or application or you know course design, having not having just the same voices in the room, making sure that's a broad range of individuals from across your institution coming together, because it's important to hear the concern. We have some folks that that maybe didn't drink the Kool Aid and they're very nervous about AI and are you know rightly so. And it, rather than downplaying that, I think it's really important to, to pause and listen and understand and to have that conversation so that we can move forward in a way that um, relates to everyone in terms of their own individual perspective. So that collaborative design, really worth the effort for sure. In addition to what Judy and Christy said, you know, going back to finding the right balance of human effort and, and automation um, and fi really finding the human in this, but I also, one, one thing I, that we're thinking about is as we're looking with our, because every provider that we're working with has some kind of AI enhancement. And so at, if your role really involves looking at tools, selecting um, different kinds of products, really talk to them about it because it reminds me of, I want to show my age, but it reminds me of the early 90s where everyone had an online tool and we really could have ended up with a real tapestry of an architecture of um, learning management systems and, and different enabling tools. AI is at that moment of time. And so as you're thinking through your learner experience, really really work with the vendors that you're working with and find out what's on their roadmap. We're looking at doing a summit with all of our key strategic partners so that we can know really know where they think they're headed, give them feedback about what we need, but also we can then create a thoughtful ecostructure or ecosystem for uh, an infrastructure for our learners in our communities. Well, I um, before I turn this back over to Megan to close us out, I want to thank Christy and Tina and Judy. This has been a fantastic conversation and probably the high point of my day, if not the high point of my week. So thank you all so much. And Megan, close us out. Great. And thank you, Van. Thanks for being such an adept and fun moderator as always. And thank you to our presenters. So WCET, I tried to plug in a few of those in the chat, but it was such a crazy, busy chat, you might have lost them. We have several links here that are AI resources, and uh, the last one I shared was the AI policy database, where we're compiling uh, AI policies from institutions. So check that out. If one is missing, there's a way to um, suggest that we include that. And... Do stay tuned. If this is your first WCET event, we hope to see you on future events. We have a, a webcast to be announced shortly, and then we have a few member-only closer conversations coming up uh, around all Fed regs that are uh, certainly probably keeping you up at night. So there's those events that are coming up. You can always follow our events on our event page and on LinkedIn and save the date for July 30 to 31 in St. Louis for our distance ed workshop. That's the changing landscape of new regulations. We just closed our call for proposals for the annual meeting, which will be held in Long Beach, California. So save the date and registration will launch in May. Lastly, I just wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors, they really do help make much of our work here at WCET possible, and we're very grateful for their generous support, as well as our supporting members, Brigham Young, California State University, Colorado State University, Michigan State, the University of Arizona, and the University of Florida. So thank you to those partners. And again, thank you for being a, a wonderful audience, and we'll see you soon at another event. Take care, everybody.